What I would like to do is we'll start out with the basic lock picking procedures and by basic I mean the pin by pin technique. Um, the best way to learn locksmithing is one on one, to have somebody sitting down right next to you showing you exactly what you should be doing, but it's hard to do that for a class. So I've, I've put together a videotape that we'll be looking at in segments so that you can see the close up parts of what I need to show you. And then we'll practice that, I'll circulate around and give anyone help who needs it. So feel free to raise your hand if you do need help. Um, are there any questions at all? How many of you have lock picking experience? One, two, two or three? Okay. All right. Well, um, I've taught several thousand students and what I've found during that time is that, that people who are new to locksmithing break down into about three different groups. There's always about 10% who just take to it like gangbusters. It's like they have some kind of genetic predisposition to opening locks. They open the course lock, then they open every lock in their house, and then they go over to their neighbors and they open all their locks. Uh, they're just great at it. There's another corresponding 10% that just really aren't that good. They just seem to have problems from the get-go. And usually these are people who have trouble understanding the basic concepts. And by basic concepts, I mean how a pin tumbler lock works and exactly what you're trying to do when you pick it. And then about 80% have a moderate degree of success. They practice some uh, within eight, 10 hours. They have all the foundation they need to continue practicing and get better. One thing I have percent who are really good that don't practice. So. You'll hear me talk a lot today about practicing. If you want to become, if you want to become good at lock picking, you're going to have to practice. And so that's, that's our goal today is to get you to a point where you can go back and practice picking locks. And this is a really fun subject. I mean, this, this is not real dry, lots of theoretical, mathematical type stuff. Um, it takes some kind of feel, uh, a little bit of a knack for what you're doing. And you have to understand, like I said, how the pin tumbler operates. So let me start with our first video segment. We'll do a couple of exercises and then we'll start picking. The two parts of a lock cylinder that are easiest to identify is the lock plug and the lock shell. The plug contains the keyway of the lock and it's designed to rotate when the correct key is inserted. The shell of the lock extends around the plug. The shell also contains a chamber that holds the pin stacks in place. In this lock you can see this brass retaining bar is holding in a series of pin stacks. We'll talk a little bit more about what pin stacks are in just a minute. If you look at the back of the plug, you'll see a tailpiece. And there are different kinds of tailpieces. We'll go into those in detail in the course. But it's just important to know that the tailpiece usually has two functions. One is to hold the lock plug into place. In this case, it's held in by these two screws. And then the other function is to unlock or to trip whatever security mechanism that the lock is designed to operate in. In this case, the tailpiece is a cam. As you turn the key, the cam rotates down. And in this specific type of mortise cylinder, the cam would activate a locking mechanism to unlock the door to toggle the door either locked or unlocked. Here's another type of pin tumbler. This one has a different shaped shell than the last one. This is a quick set residential lock and specifically for a dead latch. You'll notice that um, there are two holes for mounting the lock and then the shell encases the lock plug just like 
in the other lock we just saw. This tailpiece is different than in the mortar cylinder we just saw. Um, it does not by itself hold in the lock plug. That's done by this spring clip. And instead of rotating in a vertical way, this lock turns the tailpiece horizontally. But again, the tailpiece just functions to contact whatever locking mechanism we have inside the lock. Very different appearing than the first one, but exactly the same type of lock. In this type, you can also see the chamber for the pin stacks very easily. In fact, this is a retainer cap that you can remove and replace, as opposed to the, the brass retainer we saw on the mortise cylinder. You can see eas more easily with this lock that there is a space on the lock shell designed to hold the pin stacks. You've probably noticed from looking at keys that each key has cuts in it, and these cuts are to varying depths. In some ways, you can think of the depths of these cuts as being the combination for a particular lock. We've talked about a pin stack, so let's define that now. A pin stack consists of a bottom pin, a top pin, and a spring. In this lock, there are five pin stacks. Now you'll notice from the key that this is the correct key because the bottom pins raise to the same height when this key is inserted. The bottom pins are the pins that you'll find in the plug. When the key correctly raises the bottom pins to this height, then the, the lock plug can rotate, and it rotates based on the gap between these pins. If the pins are all lined up, you can see that there's a straight line where, where there's a gap between the top and bottom pin. The spring stays in the lock shell, and it serves as downward force to make sure that the, the pins do fall into the lock plug and pass the lock plug into the lock shell when this key is taken out. To better understand how all this works together, we're going to use this lock cylinder, which is very similar to the ones that we looked at before, except that this cylinder has been cut away so that you can actually see how the plug and the pins interact. We're going to clamp this in a vise and get a closer look, and that should really lock in for you uh, how the... The cutaway lock is a great training aid because it allows you to see how all the components of the lock work together in different circumstances. Uh, let's begin by inserting a key blank into the lock, that is a key with no cuts in it, uh, which will cause all the pins in the lock to be raised to their highest positions. And you can see that the bottom pins, which are purple in this case, are raised above the shear line so that the lock still can't open. This view gives you the best uh, idea of an entire pin stack and how it works in the plug. Now let's take a look at how the lock is with the correct key inserted. You can see that the bottom pins, or rather the top pins, have been aligned in a straight line. That's because the top pins in this lock are all the same length. And they're being driven by spring pressure down to the shear line, but they don't cross it. As you can see here, the bottom pins are being retained in the plug. So that as you rotate the lock, the pins stay in the plug. 
that's one reason that you can't remove a key from a lock uh, once you've turned it. Once we get it back to the locking position, you can watch the top pins come down, lock up the plug so that the lock can't turn. One final condition is when the incorrect key is inserted into the lock. You'll notice that in these two pin stacks, the bottom pins have been raised above the shear line, while in this far right pin stack and this pin stack, uh, the pins have, the top pins have been driven into the plug. So unless the key is cut to the exact combination that will raise them to the right height so that the gap between the plugs or the gap between the pins is aligned with the top of the plug and the lock open. Let's begin with a very fast simple exercise that you can do to get a lot of information about a lock before you pick it. To do this we're going to use a standard diamond point pick we're going to rotate the pick upside down so that we have a flat blade all the way across. And then we're going to insert the pick into the lock all the way to the back. Raise up on the pick so that we're retaining all the pins in their most upward position. And then we're going to slowly remove as we count the number of pins. One, two, three four, and five. Okay, that's telling us that we have a standard five pin pin tumbler lock. It's also telling us that all the pin stacks inside the lock are working fine. That is, there's no broken springs or no jammed pins. And it's also giving me some feedback on exactly how the lock, um, the state of the lock. For example, because the pins are snapping back so sharply, I know that this is a relatively new lock that has very good springs because they're snapping so fast back into the keyway. That's going to affect how much plug tension we use and how much upward force we're going to have to use to pick the lock. You might want to do it several times because it just takes a few seconds, but it'll give you a lot of information about a lock before you even begin picking it. The next thing we're going to address is plug tension. It's impossible to pick a lock unless you apply the correct tension to it. And actually, it's torque. But in the industry, it's, it's commonly referred to as tension that we apply to the, to the uh, plug of the lock. One of the most important factors is exactly how much force we use. The um, tension wrench is inserted into the keyway of the lock and turn. Usually you want to keep your finger at the furthest point down on the pick as you possibly can. That'll give you just a more uniform amount of tension. And you can use this wrench in to turn either counter to turn the plug either counterclockwise, like we're doing right now, or clockwise by just reinserting it on the other side and and putting tension that way. It's impossible to pick a lock without tension on the plug. You'll just have to learn by experience how much to, to use to pick a lock. One way that is very good for testing how much tension to use is go back to our quick exercise, insert the pick to the very back, raise up on all the pins, and then apply some tension to the plug. As you slowly release tension, you'll find the point at which the pin snap back down. Right there. You want to apply just enough tension to create a binding effect on the pins. That is, the plug is turning just enough to bind those pins, but not so much. The more resistance you'll have to, to the pick insofar as how much it 
how much uh, force it requires upward to pick the pin. Let's do that one more time. Lots of tension now. We'll slowly release it. We're trying to feel for just the right amount that we'll have to use while picking. That's it right there. You'll notice just it's it's almost no force at all required. You need to do this several times too before you pick a lock. It, it'll in the long run save you a lot of time. And if you can do it so that you're hearing pins snap back individually, it's a very good sign. And some pins won't be retained. Don't worry about that. Just Raise it up. There goes one. Very good exercise. Put it right on the other side. Now you'll notice that doing it, rotating the plug here counterclockwise we're not catching as many pins in fact we're not catching any at all in this example there goes one but doing this backward and forward it appears that the easiest way to pick this lock is going to be using the wrench in a counterclockwise direction because we had we could hear many more pins being retained and, and then dropping back down. That's telling us that to, the easiest way to pick this lock is going to be in the clockwise direction. Now in the field you will normally have to pick a lock so that the, the top of the plug of the lock rotates toward the door jam or toward the door latch. In this case though, we're, we're going to apply counterclockwise force. Uh, it's also possible to pick a lock in the wrong direction so that it doesn't unlock a lock, but then also spin it back around to the right direction using a tool called a plug spinner. A very common locksmithing tool. It allows you to pick a lock in any direction that you want and then to spin it so that it'll be in the right orientation to unlock the lock. Beginners to lock picking almost always tend to use too much torque on the plug of the lock. So to demonstrate just how little can actually be used to open up a lock, we're going to use this half dollar. Um, it's been glued to a standard tension wrench. We're going to insert that into the keyway of the lock and see if we can open it just using the weight of this half dollar to open the lock. It's important to realize that lock picking is a complex mechanical task. What makes it complex is that your attention is divided between two separate tasks and that is number one manipulating the pins of the lock and number two applying the correct amount of tension to the plug to get the lock open and no more than that. When you apply too much tension what you do is set up a situation in which you're basically battling yourself because the more you apply above that specific amount required to open the lock you make the manipulations of the pin harder manipulation of the pin stack harder and that's a situation that we want to avoid now this specific example is admittedly a bit extreme but it's important to realize that you will almost never have to apply as much 
plug tension as you might think to get a lock open. That's the point of this exercise. Wrenches come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Uh, let's quickly review some of them. The ones that we've been using up to now are just made of spring steel bent into an L shape and then bent along the other axis so that your finger will contact the blade in a flat way so that the wrench itself provides some spring force. And this is a very standard type wrench that's included with most pick sets. And the, the type that I recommend that, that you use as a beginner, once you get a little bit more experienced, you may decide to go to a different type of, of wrench for different circumstances or for different methods. This is just simply a piece of spring steel that's been bent into a Z shape. You'll notice that with this type of wrench, there is very little spring force that you can apply to it. It gives you a much more direct feel for the lock plug and, and uh, many locksmiths prefer it because they feel like they have a better feeling for how the pin stacks are moving uh, with with the uh, direct force, some types of wrenches contact both the top and bottom of the keyway, which does give you a little bit more equal force along the keyway. But one reason I don't like these wrenches is because as you're picking, uh, especially when you're using the raking technique and some of the other techniques we're going to discuss here shortly, is that as you're coming out of the keyway, you'll often tend to dislodge the pick or the wrench with the pick. Uh, that can be especially frustrating if you're very close to getting a lock open and at the very last second you lose spring pressure or wrench pressure because you've dislodged the pick itself. However, it all boils down to personal preference and what works for you. Many locksmiths do prefer this type of wrench. This, for example, is one that is imported from England. It's made out of spring steel and it's adjustable. Uh, it can be configured so that it fits a keyway very snugly. Because it's flat at the top and bottom, uh, there's less likelihood of snagging the wrench and dislodging it as you're picking, but it still happens if you're going to use the type of wrench that contacts the top and bottom of the keyway. However, over time, uh, everyone tends to come up with techniques that work better for them. It's, as I said, a matter of personal preference, but I would recommend that you start with the simplest type of wrench, which is the L, the L-shaped type that comes with your pick kit. Once you get a little bit more proficient at picking, you can experiment with some of the other techniques and find the wrench that works the best for you. Now let's move on to basic lock picking and the pin by pin technique. One of the best tools for this technique is the hook or feeler pick because this pick allows you to pick a pin without disturbing the pins on each side of that pin. A lot of locksmiths prefer this pick, especially for the technique that we're about to learn. I personally prefer the diamond pick because it allows me to move back and forth along the keyway a little bit easier than the hook pick does. The steps for this technique are covered in detail in your manual, but to quickly summarize, what we're going to do is insert the tension wrench into the lock, keeping in mind two things. Number one, we want to make sure that the wrench is low as possible in the keyway so that it gives us as much freedom as we can get to pick the pins. Also, we want to make sure that it's not hanging up here at the very bottom of the keyway on the lock shell 
we want all the force we apply to the wrench to go to the plug and not be drained by hanging up on the bottom of the shell. What we're going to do is go into the lock, gently lifting on each pin, looking for a pin or pins uh, that feels stuck in the keyway, one that's not moving as freely as the others. I think I found one. So I'm going to gently lift up on that pin. You can twist the pick from side to side and move underneath the pin, um, just applying gentle force until we get it picked. Now right there I heard a click. I didn't feel anything on the plug, but I did hear a click. So that leads me to believe that probably that pin has been picked. Now we'll just continue the procedure with each pin in the lock, scanning back and forth along the keyway until we find the next pin that seems most resistant to our picking efforts, and we'll pick that one. And so on until we finally have all the pins in the lock picked. One thing that you can do with this technique is overpick a pin, which means that you've raised the bottom pin above the shear line. Once that's happened, the only thing you can do is release tension and start over again. Now in picking that pin, I did feel the plug turn just a little bit which tells me that we were successful in, in picking that one. Don't spend a lot of time on one pin. Make sure that you keep scanning back and forth beneath the pins with your pick, looking for the one that has now become the hardest to lift. I suspect that in this attempt, I may have overpicked one of the pin stacks. So we're going to reset, just take tension off the plug, start over again. That one's got that one's picked because I heard it and also felt it through the wrench. And there we have some success. Let's try it one more time. The important thing about this technique is that it's the only technique we'll cover that gives you direct sensory feedback on what a pin stack feels like once it's been picked, and that's very important to building uh, your information base to help you become a more skilled lock picker. I think in that case I had too much tension. And what happens when you do that is you tend to overpick the pin. This is a very valuable technique. Why don't we now go to one of the lock cutaways, and that will actually let you to allow you to see the pins as they're being picked. One very important point to keep in mind, whether you're using the pin-by-pin -pin technique or any other technique, is to keep the pick blade level with the line of the bottom pins as you pick. The action should be to move the pick beneath a pin and then apply direct upward force, keeping the blade level as you pick. There is a tendency in lock picking to tilt the blade as you pick. And as you can see with this particular lock, if you tilt the blade too much, you will over pick pins. Once a pin has been overpicked, there's nothing you can do from that point on to pick the lock. You'll see with this pin right here that because the pick was tilted so much while I was working on a back pin, we've overpicked it. The top and bottom pin is now above the shear line. And regardless of what we do to the remaining pins, this lock will not open until we reset it and start over. The skill that you'll gain with practice and what you need to start doing from the very beginning is keep the blade level and let the point of the pick do all the work for you. 
so that we can better keep track of what we're doing with this lock, we're going to just randomly number the pins. We're going to call this pin number one. This one will be pin number four. This is a standard five pin tumbler. Uh, the first pin chamber is empty so that the lock could be cut away and put into this configuration. So we'll begin very light tension on the plug. What we're trying to do is scan beneath the pins to locate one pin, sometimes it'll be more than one, that isn't moving. In this case it seems to be pin number four. So what I'm going to try to do is get up underneath that pin with the point of the pick and apply direct upward force until the pin is, is uh, picked. In this case I heard a click. I also felt the plug move just a little bit and we'll continue back and forth movement. Now you'll notice that pin number three is the one that's not moving. So we'll get up underneath pin number three, apply direct upward force and see if we can pick it. Sometimes it's hard depending on which pick you're using to to keep the the point of the pick directly underneath the pin, but that's what we're going to do. Felt a little click there. And in this case we're going to go back to scanning back and forth and you'll notice that pin number three is still the one that's not moving, so I obviously didn't pick it high enough. I'm going to get the pick back into place. My upward force. Now I've got it. You may have heard that click. Continue scanning back and forth. Now pin number two is the one that is unyielding. Get up underneath it. Pick it. And of course the only one we'll have left now is number one. But number one is still floating freely so that tells me that I still haven't done the right job on pin number two. I return to it. Now the only pin in the entire lock that won't move is number one. lock opens. We'll do that one more time. Start with very light plug tension. Scan the keyway. Find pin number four. It's picked. Scanning again. Now number three is not moving. Number two. to get up underneath the pin and raise it or manipulate it without disturbing adjacent pins. The feeler pick doesn't slide under the keyway as well as other picks, but it's extremely useful for the pin-by-pin -pin technique. Many locksmiths tend to find one pick shape and to use it for most of their picking. But for this specific technique, the hook or feeler pick is excellent to use.
Let's begin your training in advanced lock picking with a technique that's known as scrubbing. You can use a variety of different picks to perform this technique. Some of the most popular are the half round pick, the rake pick, this is one of my personal favorites. All the ver different varieties of wave shaped picks, the double ball pick, and of course the diamond, technically the half diamond pick. As I said earlier, this pick tends to be the widest used pick in the locksmithing industry. As you gain more experience, you'll, you'll come to rely on a specific pick shape for the majority of your lock picking and I think it's safe to say that among people who pick locks professionally uh, this is the most common and widely used pick. To scrub a lock we'll begin as usual with inserting the tension wrench. With the scrubbing technique we want to begin with very light spring pressure that will increase gradually as we continue with the process. Likewise with the pick, we want to start with very light upward force on the pick and then we'll increase that as we go along. We start by just simply moving the pick back and forth along the keyway beneath the bottom pins and we'll gradually increase the pressure as we go along not trying to focus on any individual pin but just focusing on a smooth action of all the pins in the lock. Uh, if you happen to feel one that's particularly stuck it's fine to stop, pick that pin individually and then proceed on with the scrubbing technique. Remember to start with very light force and tension and to increase it as you go along. By starting with very light force, what we're doing is picking up the very long bottom pins that don't need to be lifted very much, uh, getting them locked into place and then working more on the shorter ones. And this lock, I definitely feel the first pin locking up a lot, so I'm going to go ahead and pick that as we did before and then just continue on scrubbing, applying stronger pressure as we go along until the lock opens. Let's try the scrubbing technique with this commercial pin tumbler. This is the type of lock you'll normally see installed on glass front storefronts. The type of storefronts that um, have metal frames around them. You'll notice that the scrubbing technique is sometimes a lot faster and a lot easier than the pin by pin technique that we used before. The pin by pin technique is extremely important because it's the foundation for all the lock picking that you'll do. And even with the scrubbing technique, occasionally if you, you'll feel a, a pin that is very resistant as you're scrubbing the other ones and you can stop, pick that individual pin and then continue with scrubbing. It's a very effective technique. It's very common with scrubbing to over pick pins. So after you try for a few minutes, if you don't have any success, release tension and try again. Starting very light and getting progressively heavier as you go with more force. Sometimes 
uh, rotating the pick so that you get a better angle in the keyway will help you and a lot of times it's more effective to scrub in both directions it's easier to, to just scrub as you remove the pick but uh, a lot of times it's important to contact the pin with the forward stroke of your pick too at this point the plug has rotated quite a bit I can tell that I'm very close to picking but all the pins now are feeling real springy that's a clue that we need to reset try again A lot of times when you have trouble scrubbing a lock, it's because you're not making uh, contact with the very first pin in the lock. It's real easy to uh, avoid contacting that pin as you scrub because you're not bringing the pick all the way out. Uh, as you begin scrubbing, if you, in, if you end up entirely removing the pick, that's fine. Just keep the tension and continue scrubbing as you normally would but make a focused effort to contact all five pins as you're scrubbing very effective technique often much faster much easier than the pin by pin technique returning now to our cutaway lock so that you can see how the pins look as they're being picked with scrubbing. Scrubbing is one of the most widely used techniques and you can probably see why. You'll notice right there that we overpicked this one pin, this first pin, but because um, we're keeping lighter spring tension on the lock, lighter torque, yeah, it went ahead and unpicked itself same as this situation right here this is another reason for using uh, the lightest possible tension on the wrench that you can and it also shows kind of the inherent nature of scrubbing in that you're just looking for that fraction of a second in which all the pins are lined up One of the fastest techniques for opening a lock is called the raking technique. And it's so named because uh, it's usually performed with a rake pick. This is the first technique that we'll look at that uses kinetic energy to open a lock. And by that I mean that when the tines of this rake contact all the bottom pins of the lock as it's quickly removed from the keyway, the energy from the pick will be transferred through the bottom pin to the top pin which will uh, for just momentarily 
fly away from the bottom pin. And that is that the top and bottom pins will be separated for just a fraction of a second. One of the most important things with the raking technique is to use extremely light plug tension. And the key to this technique is finding the line that you're going to follow going out of the lock with the, with the pick. You're going to have to make sure that you hit all pins equally as you quickly remove the pick from the key wing. A raking technique doesn't always work. It won't work with all locks, but it works with most locks. And once you develop a skill for doing this, you can open a lock very, very quickly. It's very common to overpick pins when using this technique, so you'll want to reset the lock often. Uh, usually you can rake three, maybe four times before you reset the lock. And a lot of times I'll go in and rake a lock once or twice just to get most of the pins picked. You can then come back in later with the half diamond or another pick to finish off the job with some uh, especially stubborn pins. The key is positioning. Make sure that the tines just contact the very bottom of the, of the key wing. My personal favorite method for opening a lock is the raking technique. Even though it's possible to open a lock in just a fraction of a second using this technique, it's important to realize that there are a lot of variables that have to be tightly controlled during that fraction of a second. One of the first is plug tension. You need to position the wrench so that it is not binding against the very bottom of the keyway, against the lock shell. And also the profile of the wrench has to be kept really low so that you can have completely unrestricted access inside the keyway. The amount of torque has to be light enough to allow all the pins in the lock to fly apart for an instant. But it also has to be strong enough that you can open the plug. When you think about it, it sometimes seems like it would be an impossibility, but it's a very efficient way to open a lock once you get just a basic amount of skill. Of course, it happens so fast that you can't see it, even with this clear lock. And it's very, very common to overpick pins while you're doing this. But because it is so fast, it's one of the techniques that I use first when I attack a lock. Because it takes so little time just to rake once or twice, then take tension off, try raking again. If that doesn't work, then you can go to some of the other techniques that we've learned, like the pin-by-pin -pin technique or even scrubbing. Uh, a technique that requires some practice to get everything right so that the, the pick is held completely level. It often helps just to find the line by moving the pick in and out before you make the the exit and with practice this can become one of the most valuable techniques there is for opening locks did you get it? good this pick set, for some reason, HPC doesn't make a true rake like the one I showed you. But a lot of locksmiths just use the diamond tool.
to. One of the most successful locksmiths I know only carries two tools, and that's a medium-sized tension wrench and a diamond pit. And a lot of locksmiths tend to get to where they focus primarily on using one, one pick for just about all their lock picking, whether it's raking or whatever. So you can try it with the diamond. There's also this one, doesn't have a handle, but it's, it's um, a two-pointed rake. And let's see, also, also I think this snake pick, this one that's kind of, that has kind of a wave shape on it, would also work. But I would, I would tend to use the diamond point, see if that works. And the key is just hitting it at exactly the right spot with just, just the exact right amount of plug tension. You don't want to hit it real high up on the pin. You want it just to barely graze the bottom of the pins. Just apply enough force to get the, the, the top pin to pop up. Now let's quickly look at a tool, uh, probably the first tool that was ever designed specifically to use the kinetic energy technique to open locks. And this is called a pick gun. As you can see, this one's pretty scarred up because it spent most of its life in my tool bag being beat around. I don't use this tool much, and um, I'll show you why in just a minute. But the pit gun can be an effective tool for opening locks with the kinetic energy technique. It's just simply a gun with a blade. Every time you pull the trigger, the blade rises up once sharply to apply a blow on the bottom pins. <clears throat> this um, gun also has a, a wheel that you can turn to adjust the tension, increase or decrease the tension. For the most part, I keep it on the minimum. Well, let's just quickly look at how the gun works in actual practice. Just like the uh, raking technique, we'll apply light plug tension. Insert the tool all the way to the back of the lock and then back out just a little bit. Then lift upward until we can kind of find the line that would allow it to stay underneath all the pins at once. Try to hold it in place as we pull the trigger. You'll notice that with the pick gun we sometimes need to rotate the gun to overcome obstacles in the keyway because this keyway has a ward right here that uh, could easily hang up the blade. I'm going to tilt it just a little bit to the right. Just like raking, it's very easy to overpick pins with the pick gun, so you want to reset often. invention of this tool is credited to the magician Harry Houdini. Unusual way to open locks. There is however an even more effective tool that we'll look at next. This is the HPC Electropick in my opinion one of the most effective tools ever invented for locksmithing and lock picking. Uh, the tool is a battery powered rechargeable vibrating pick. It's operated by a trigger that can be in a locked position so that it doesn't accidentally um, turn itself on and also in two different operating positions. The pick blade itself is made of spring steel just like regular picks. Adjustment of the throw or amount of upward movement for this pick 
is provided by this turn knob uh, that also has a locking knob beneath it. A lot of students have trouble using these at first because it does take a little bit different feel than it does with other types of picking. One of the most important aspects to using this tool is to have the correct blade throw uh, for the given lock that you're working on. And I generally advise about an eighth of an inch or slightly less depending on which lock you're working on. As you can tell, about the only drawback to this tool is that it's a little bit noisy. But it usually doesn't take very long to open a lock with this. If it does, uh, the first thing you want to do is adjust blade throw. Um, and other than that, in my opinion, it's the greatest thing ever invented. Let's take a look at it with a few different locks. We'll go back to our standard quick set that we've been using. That's with all the kinetic energy techniques. Very important to use very light plug tension. Also using this tool, a lot of locksmiths like to remove tension entirely and just keep applying light tension as the tool is working. Uh, that seems to be a very effective technique. To use it, just insert the blade to the very back of the lock, just like we did with the pick gun. I personally tend to like to use the vibrating pick upside down, although it's, it's the standard way is to use it right side up, all the way to the back of the lock plug. With this tool, we want to make especially sure that we have it tilted just right so that we're contacting the base of all the pins at once. We want to remove it just a little bit from the very back of the lock so that it doesn't hang up back there. And then just push the button. Very easy to overpick pins with this tool. I suspect for this particular lock the blade throw may be just a little bit less than it should be, but it's still working effectively. A lot of times it'll open a lock within just a fraction of a second after pulling the trigger. You'll notice when the, the tool is in a position where the blade can't move, you'll get a little bit different sound, and you want to try to become aware of that sound so that you'll know that, that the blade's not reaching full movement. Here's what it sounds like when it's trapped. As opposed to having free movement. Just an excellent tool that will overcome many locks that you'll find are too stubborn to be picked. While using the tool, uh, make sure you rotate it until you find just the right angle. And also apply and remove tension if you need to. Looking for that one instant when all the pins are separated. Try some other locks. This is a five pin mortise cylinder that we used earlier. Fairly good quality mortise cylinder. One of the important things uh, with the pick gun, too, is to keep the pick as low as possible in the keyway. Um, if you notice that your pick is bouncing out, or the wrench is bouncing out, that then that's that's a hint that your 
that it's not being placed correctly. This is a very restricted keyway. But we'll try it anyway. This is a six pin mortise cylinder, a little bit higher security than what we've been using. Um, this one's very common in commercial applications. And once again, just a few minutes spent Getting the blade at the right angle and position correctly will save you a lot of time in the long run. That's what I mean about the wrench popping out. Try one more time. Just an incredible tool takes a little bit of practice, but well, well worth the results that you'll get from it. It's really effective if you rotate the pick in the keyway as you're picking, because usually the reason it doesn't work is because the blade's not getting enough energy to the base of the pins. So turn it a little bit as you're picking. Um, it even helps sometimes to tilt it back and forth, but do that last because that, you really want to have even force underneath the pins as much as you can. And once you tilt, you start uh, getting off and, and you won't do that. But do, you can try it as a last resort. Um, let's see. I guess that's it with the, with the pit gun. If you notice that you're pulling your gun out and the blade has just got metal all over it, then is, uh, one of the reasons is because they're blend, brand new blades and they may need to be honed down a little with, a bit. I've got um, a hone with me, so if that happens to you, let me know and we'll try to smooth your blade out. With wrapping, what you do is there's there's a piece of metal in here that goes into the groove of the shackle and that piece of metal is called the locking dog. If you can, if you can hit the shackle of a lock with enough force, you can, you can many times hit it hard enough that again the kinetic energy technique will, will throw that locking dog off to the side for just a second and the lock will open. So you're pulling the same Right, just pull on this rubber band a little bit. And of course, this would be on a, on a hasp or something, so you'd put the rubber band on the body of the lock. And you have to figure out which side of the shackle is the one to hit. But that's all it takes. Do you want to know which side it is on? No, you just say it's, it's just trial, by, trial and error. Sometimes you can pull the shackle out and look down in there and see that you know, one side has a, a groove in it and, and the other doesn't. But uh, in general, that's all it takes. And the nice thing is, is it doesn't damage the lock at all. Now with padlocks, you want to make sure that you hit the shackle and not the body because they'll dent real easily. <laughs>